Welcome everyone to the Southern IPM Hour. This one is an ARDP project on water deficit cotton. We are going to go ahead and get started for today. We're really glad that you're here, so thank you so much for joining us. If you'd like to, you can tell us who you are and who you represent in the chat. We'd love to say hello that way. And uh, this webinar series is a part of the Southern IPM Center, where we present research issues and programs in integrated pest management from the Southern region through this webinar series. I'm Kayla Watson. I'm the communication director for the Southern IPM Center. And we are housed at NC State and UGA with a mission to coordinate IPM across the region. We are also one of four regional IPM centers supported by the USDA NIFA Crop Protection and Pest Management Regional Coordination Program. We always get this question, but this talk will be recorded and that link will be available after the webinar if you'd like to share it or if you um, have parts of it that you'd like to see again, you'll be able to do that. For the webinar today, if you have questions throughout the talk, uh, we will hold those to the end. So you can type those into the Q&A as we go, or you can raise your hand at the end of the talk. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Mega Parajali. He is a professor and faculty fellow and uh, Texas A&M Regents Fellow in the Department of Entomology at Texas A&M AgriLife. So he does quite a lot and so much so that he received a Southern IPM Center Friends of IPM Award in, 22, or in 2022, where he was inducted to the Southern IPM Hall of Fame. Um, and he's gonna be talking to us today about his ARDP funded project. So welcome, Mega, and thanks so much for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Kayla, for that wonderful introduction. So uh, with that, uh, uh, all the accolades that uh, you kind of mentioned about me, that gives me tremendous pressure here. Um, <clears throat> and also, I like to invite, I don't see who I joined or how many on my uh, screen, but uh, all those uh, folks who are uh, who were able to join uh, this live presentation and those who will be watching uh, the recorded video, I would greatly appreciate the opportunity to share with you uh, and hopefully to the public, uh, if it does become public, uh, that uh, the NIFA supported uh, ag research, entomological research, crop pest management and cropping system research, what we have done in Texas and Georgia. It's a multi-state project uh, and, uh, you know, right uh, at the outset, I would appreciate uh, uh, on behalf of entire uh, uh, PDs and co-PDs, uh, I appreciate uh, NIFA, uh, uh, CPPM, ARDP uh, program uh, for the support and trust in our work. Um, and uh, uh, let's uh, 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 let's start the presentation. And again, this is the final report of the grant. Uh, it's uh, listed here, grant number 12623544, Developing Insect Pest Management Strategies in Water Deficit Cotton Production Systems. And the second part of this uh, uh, the overall uh, project was to develop management recommendations for production sustainability uh, for our cotton producers. My co-authors or co-PDs are Abdul Hakim, who I since left my uh, program, and Dr. Michael Tace, who is in Georgia. Uh, it was between Texas High Plains and Georgia uh, Collaborative Research. Uh, Diana McAllister, uh, Ag Economist. Katie Lewis, soil scientist at Texas A&M, and Suhas Bevahari, extension specialist. It was not only research, but it was really applied research extension uh, type project. Uh, our, uh, our goal was to develop some uh, production uh, management recommendations, uh, and that is conveyed to our producers so that they can, uh, they can utilize our recommended uh, production practices. Let's see. Slide is not forwarding, just one second. Just a brief intro on uh, where we are, what we are doing, and why the project, and so forth. So we set the stage for the uh, uh, for the research information that I'll be sharing. Uh, Texas, uh, 
uh, produces about or uh, Texas uh, has the share of uh, you know more than half uh, on an average 56 percent of U.S. cotton is produced in Texas and you can see since 2008 I mean when I uh, joined in 2001 as project leader uh, in Lubbock uh, we had about 40 percent uh, Texas share of cotton was 40 percent and it jumped and you can see now uh, consistently for the last uh, uh, 12, 14 years or so, uh, we have been uh, 55, 56 percent. And of that, uh, you can see on the map on the right, uh, uh, two thirds or about 70 percent of our Texas cotton is produced uh, in the uh, 200 mile radius uh, of where I where I reside. That's what we call is Texas high plains. So much of our cotton is uh, in this region. Uh, so when you when you drive through this area, uh, I mean, it's Texas uh, high plains is truly a, a cotton country. Uh, you can see cotton everywhere during planting and harvesting time is real fun. I mean, everywhere it looks white. I wish I had that picture here. Uh, but we have two things going on here. We have reduced water availability because of uh, uh, declining uh, Ogallala uh, Aquifer Reservoir uh, water resource. Uh, so we have low water availability, but uh, simultaneously we are a semi-arid region. Our uh, annual average rain is only 18 inches. So now you can see in this graph that uh, uh, the last several years, uh, our dry land acreage has gone up to close to 70%. So we are more than two thirds of our uh, acreage is dry land. And even the irrigated cotton is very limited irrigation. You know, we just call it irrigated, but it's only supplemental irrigation. Full irrigation is probably very, very low, 5%, less than 10% cotton. So we, uh, we had lots of uh, uh, production issues that our farmers have to uh, face with. Uh, and and shortage of water we, I talked about, but also the prevalent windy storms. Uh, these both are the major challenges for Texas high plains cotton production. You can see it like this uh, picture here that it's a pretty uh, common uh, during our uh, cotton uh, cotton planting germination. And right now, you know, we have we have gone through this kind of thing. This year, of course, we have gotten more rain than we have ever received. Uh, during the planting time, but we are pretty dry and we have this kind of sandy storm, sand blasting of seedling cotton and so forth. You can see the, as I just said, the sand blast, sand blasting is a big issue for us. We also get, you know, hail storm and wind hazard and all that kind of thing. We get all kinds of issues and uh, it's just a very difficult uh, uh, to, to uh, get through this. We get um, replanting and, you know, we always think that replanting is sort of like more of a norm uh, uh, in the high plains uh, cotton system. So the major cotton production issues we have is irrigation water is the most limiting factor in cotton production in the Texas high plains. Not so much uh, in uh, in Georgia, but they do have some issues with uh, water also. Water stress plants are more susceptible to insect induced injury and limiting factors render lower compensatory ability of cotton. My uh, long-term research has uh, shown that cotton has tremendous compensatory ability if you provide uh, nitrogen and uh, water and the length of the season, uh, they would keep growing and compensate any loss in, uh, uh, induced by insects. But we have limiting factors. We don't have that luxury. So, but, uh, but the plant's fruit carrying capacity is also low at this kind of situation. Therefore, insect management is in itself a quite a complex issue. And also, be, before I forget, Texas high plains uh, cotton production uh, is really a low input system because we cannot afford uh, putting lots of uh, uh, input variables such as insecticides and so forth because our production is low. It's a dry land and it's just a, uh, it's a, it's a harsh environment. And our insect situation, uh, I'm focusing more on Texas high plains uh, and I'll just kind of refer to uh, Georgia. Uh, uh, one nice thing going on in Texas high plains cotton system is we have predictable key insect pests. So we can predict pretty much the uh, first four weeks 
uh, uh, once the cotton germinates, we have only issue that's thrips. Thrips is by far the most uh, 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 destructive pest or uh, most uh, economic pest uh, for our cotton system. As you heard me saying that, uh, you know, we have lots of uh, harsh weather issues. So that makes our seedlings very susceptible or vulnerable to any level of thrips injury because plants are so stressed and so, uh, uh, you know, so weak, a little bit of injury makes uh, uh, in that cotton just sit there and not grow uh, in a, for a long time. And then we run out of growing season. So thrips become very important and paste for us and followed by cotton flea upper cotton flea uppers come in about a squaring stage and uh, they would be no longer uh, pestiferous uh, after cotton starts blooming so about three weeks of that window little window is uh, our cotton flea upper susceptibility window after that our major insects are uh, ligus bugs. Ligus uh, hesperus is the dominant one here. Cotton aphids can show up occasionally. Uh, we do have some uh, sting bug issues, some caterpillar issues. Uh, if we have, we still have 30% non BT cotton in our area, only 70 75% uh, transgenic BT cotton. So we do have some caterpillar issues, uh, cornea roam, uh, bowl worm. Uh, 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 tobacco board worm uh, and so forth but it's it's not a year in year out issue so we have like a two three uh different insects that uh that infest uh, after cotton starts blooming uh in georgia uh there is more of a sting bug problems uh, uh than ligus you know, we do have a little bit of uh, cotton aphid issues late in the season when cotton opens, uh, uh, potentially causing the sticky lint and so forth. But that has not been a problem in the Texas Iplanes for the last 20 years. So we, we are concerned, but uh, uh, economically, that's, that's not an issue anymore. So the, the objectives, uh, the two major objectives of our, of our project was number one, Quantify the impact of single versus sequential pests. So thrips or cotton flea upper early in the season. So thrips followed by cotton thrips and cotton flea upper by themselves singly, or when they both appear, what happens? And for and also the third was thrips and ligus versus uh, thrips and sting bugs in uh, in Georgia versus sequential infestation, you, you understood that, on cotton lint yield and fiber quality under three irrigation water regimes. I'll get to that in the next slide, the, the, the uh, uh, explanation of the, uh, the uh, research design. And then second objective was develop a dynamic optimization economic model that maximizes the net returns on these 12 management scenarios. There are more than 12, but in, in any one combination, there will be 12 scenarios. Uh, I'll show you right here. Uh, there may be more, I think, I don't know why. Uh, 12, yeah. So we have like a water levels, uh, dry land, deficit irrigation, full irrigation. So dry land is just, you know, we don't uh, put any more uh, water once uh, uh, once cotton is planted, but we do give a little bit of water uh, so that cotton is germinated. So it's not truly dry land. We do give uh, pre-planted uh, irrigation, not a lot, just sufficient to, uh, sufficient to uh, germinate uh, seeds. And uh, deficit irrigation was about 30 and, you know, 30 to 40 percent of uh, uh, the, the uh, ET uh, and about 90 percent ET. Full irrigation is never full irrigation in the Texas pipeline system. Uh, we consider about 90 percent ET. So that's full irrigation. We have thrips treated versus not treated and cotton flea upper followed by singly or followed by uh, cotton flea upper. Uh, or ligus or sting bugs. So we have, in any combination, we have actually 12 times three followed by kind of things, so sequential, so 36 different scenarios. 
but I'm not going to present all uh, for this, but I'll just give uh, just the overview of what I have done and uh, the other data are included in the, uh, the NIFA reports, uh, so they have it. Uh, 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 for Texas High Plains, uh, we, uh, uh, and by the way, it was a four-year project, 100 in 2018 cycle, so the season of 2019, 20, 21, and 22, those four years. But we went ahead and did full research on 2018 summer, so we had one extra year given to NIFA, actually. So it has five full years of data. And because we had some weather issues and we didn't have really, uh, we didn't feel like we had sufficient data, so we extended the no cost extension of the project. So we have uh, this year also we are continuing. So we, we will eventually have six years of data, but today I'll be presenting five year summary uh, um, for this presentation. So on thrips, we planted cover crop, wheat crop here. And when wheat was uh, 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 at this stage as shown in the picture, then we'll terminate with uh, uh, Roundup and uh, plant cotton. So all the thrips in wheat will transfer to seedling cotton. And then we spray uh, those plots uh, that should not have thrips. Uh, so that's how we ensure that we had thrips. And you can see on the lower left, uh, uh, we are augmenting thrips. We didn't have, because of the you know uh, various uh, weather issues, so we didn't have enough thrips, then we would get uh, thrips from alfalfa terminals and then put along the uh, that uh, marked row. Uh, that's how we, we want to ensure that we had enough thrips, uh, at least twice the threshold at one to two leafy stage. And similarly, cotton filly upper, we would collect uh, uh, croton from uh, Brazos Valley in College Station area, bring the croton into the lab, rearing in, uh, in the lab as shown in the lower left, and uh, uh, augment uh, known number of uh, flea uppers uh, at the most susceptible stage of uh, cotton seedling on the right side, you can see, uh, right around one to two square stage. That's how we did. And like us, generally we rely on natural infestation. And if not, then uh, we just we would just collect like us from alfalfa next door and then uh, release them in the uh, and and we release the nymphs. So we didn't cage them. We just release just like we are releasing uh, flea hopper. So data collected were cotton growth, uh, squaring, and flowering profile. Thrips damage scoring, cotton flea upper induced square abscission, uh, ligase injury and bowl aversion, in Georgia sting bug injury and bowl loss, and cotton lint yield, fiber quality, and so forth. And uh, I'm not going to present uh, much of the detailed data here, just to show uh, in the high plans, uh, let's say, just I'm throwing some uh, data slide just to show I'm not going to discuss this because I'm going to uh, only discuss the summary data because that will make more sense. So this is one particular year we have on spread control, spread control, thrips, flea uppers, thrips plus flea uppers, uh, that means sequential. Similarly, I didn't, I didn't, I failed to put the uh, followed by ligase and so forth. And uh, uh, we had supplemental irrigated, fully irrigated. So again, uh, and these are the flowering profile at different treatments, how the cotton is growing and flowering and so forth. Uh, in, in Georgia, uh, here, uh, thrips data, visual damage rating uh, on the top is uh, uh, earlier date, May 20, and the lower is one week after. You can see on the lower, uh, all the treated has uh, the numbers uh, lower than uh, the untreated. That means uh, thrips uh, were causing uh, noticeable infestation in their system. Similarly, uh, sting bug data, uh, you can see a uh, lower uh, 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 graphs, four lines are treated versus the the one when there was no treatment, meaning that when there were infestations, then bowl injury was significantly higher. You can see uh, that was the economic uh, uh, 
uh, economic uh, damage. So uh, there were clearly uh, the treat our treatments did work uh, uh, to allow us to assess the uh, the research objectives. So with that, uh, so let me kind of give you the summary of uh, the five year average in Lubbock. Uh, I only wanted to have like a one set that is thrips. So control, thrips alone, flea upper alone, and thrips followed by flea upper that is sequential. That is the, uh, I set the stage this way so that, uh, and I'm not going to present data on like a uh, ligus alone and uh, ligus, thrips by ligus and um, Stingberg and so forth was at the same set, same set of here. So now let's look at the dry land. Thrips reduced yield significantly in dry land and full irrigation. Over the five year period, the average data showed that uh, <clears throat> control versus Trips just next bar graph. So the circle is uh, the uh, control and trips bars are circled here. In dry land and full irrigation, significantly uh, reduced. Cotton upper is not a significant yield reducer by itself. You can see the third bar graph co compared with control, they are similar. Deficit irrigation also a little bit higher, but uh, similar. And full irrigation, you can see a little bit of decline by flea upper, but not significant. So uh, flea upper was not all that significant paste by itself. Let's go to the, uh, however, the sequential, the third one, sequential infestation increase yield loss, but the effect increases water level. What does that mean is the, uh, second bar graph is trips, and the fourth bar graph is sequential. So that has both trips and flea hopper. So compare on, on dry land, there is no significant decline by trips and flea hoppers combined because they are about the same height of the bar graph on the dry land. Why? Because dry land has low fruit uh, uh, carrying capacity. The plants are small, uh, even though flea hoppers remove squares, uh, plants could not bear more fruits anyway. Even if they had, they would abort because of the water, uh, the, the, the lack of water. So no, not much effect. Deficit irrigation, that means about third of irrigation, required irrigation. You can see there is decline indicated by arrow, but under full irrigation, if you have thrips, infestation, followed by flea upper infestation, it will significantly reduce the yield. And compared to control, we had like a 20%, over 20%, 22% yield decline when there is thrips followed by flea upper, about 11% uh, under deficit irrigation and 19% uh, in full irrigation. And uh, we have about uh, square loss is 20% uh, in 2018, 30% in 19, 15% in 20, 32% in 21, and 20% in 2022. Roughly 25% fruit loss, uh, 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 square loss was achieved by flea upper. And my previous research, research has shown about 15 to 20% square loss by flea upper before flowering can be compensated by uh, the plant, even in Texas high plants, uh, especially when we have open fall. So we wanted to make sure that we have more than 20% uh, fruit loss exerted. 2020, we had a little less than that, but other years we, we achieved at least 20% fruit loss. And uh, the effect on micronair, and I'm going to show this is, I think, 2020 slide I threw in here just to show that uh, uh, these infestations did have effect on 
all HBI parameters. I'm just showing here micro micro as an example. You can see uh, on dry land and high water uh, control height, uh, uh, low mic, uh, and uh, you can see that uh, there is, of course, uh, uh, complex phenomena here. It's not a, a linear relationship between uh, insect infestation and micro values. It is uh, confounded by water level. So you can see uh, under high water, uh, all the treatments, including uh, thrips followed by flea up or sequential treatment, all hide in premium range. Uh, so uh, when you have high water, high input, uh, uh, high yield and everything, uh, they were um, uh, they were doing better in uh, in terms of micronair uh, and dry land. They were marginal. Uh, I think uh, yeah, one uh, two treatments uh, went above uh, uh, that uh, premium range. So suffice to say that micronair was impacted, and there were other parameters also impacted by drought stress by uh, uh, by insect infestation and why we needed this we wanted to ultimately calculate all the uh, the loan value and calculate the the net profit for our farmers and the other one uh, the flea hopper versus ligers in our system as i said earlier flea hoppers are uh, uh, early season pests they are only paste uh, right before or up until uh, cotton starts uh, blooming so it's so early that when they when they remove fruits you can see under low water versus high water high water is okay uh, <clears throat> they are going a little above but uh, they are still you know 4.25 uh, and this is only 2019 data i don't have the summary data on this but look at here, uh, ligus. The ligus, they are late season insects. So um, uh, they behave uh, quite differently. Uh, under low water, flea hoppers increase micronair. Oh, uh, sorry, both. Low water and high water, both, they increase because they were removed, the squares were removed so early on. But ligers, they appear only after blooming stage. You can see 3.81 and 4.27 marginally uh, above. So they are right around the uh, 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 premium range. So, uh, and, and my other research projects show that ligers infestation doesn't really affect the uh, lint quality parameters, but does have the potential to lose weight uh, if we don't manage uh, ligus properly. And I'm trying to kind of put it all together because it was an economic project. So we had um, uh, water input here, high water, uh, about 15 inches of rain or 15 inches of water we put in, and about half. And you, you may see, okay, you are putting half here. So why is 30%? I think we were doing like a moisture measurement and so forth. I don't know how the uh, soil water relationship work, but our idea was to maintain about 30 to 40% uh, uh, ET. And we did have uh, some rain, but you can see some years, 2018, we had almost no rain, four inches during the uh, growing period. Uh, 2021 and 2019 had a uh, uh, good amount of rain. And because of rainfall, I think our dry land uh, uh, plots were also kind of messed up a little. So we didn't have a clear understanding of how actual dry land will, um, uh, will, uh, uh, will be compared to a low and high irrigation. And we calculated revenue and variable cost per unit. And you can see here, uh, lint price, we just use like a, a, a roughly uh, on an average 69 cents per acre. Uh, seed price per ton, $170. Strip and module cost, uh, uh, eight cents per pound. Ginning cost, 
and irrigation per acre. So here you can see uh, irrigated acreage variable cost and dry land variable cost for each year, but on average um, about $400 variable cost for irrigated and about $200 for variable cost for dry land. And we put it together here for average dry land results. So you can see for control thrips, flea hoppers, and sequential thrips followed by flea hopper. Lind revenue is here because it is based on the yield. And we have not factored in all the things. So, you know, we, we still have this project not ending yet because of the extension. And there is so much uh, economic analysis to be done. But we, we did uh, quick and dirty type uh, uh, calculation utilizing only the uh, lint value. We have not done the uh, fiber parameters and so forth yet, but we had seed revenue. So we have total revenue uh, line here and then cost, strip and module cost, ginning cost, and remaining variable cost, you saw 192 uh, uh, for each uh, system. That's the uh, uh, remaining, the, the variable cost for the uh, dry land system. So total variable cost is given here. And total variable cost is impacted only by lint, seed, lint and seed value because of various insect treatment. So gross margin you can see here. Control had $375 and all the way to $247 for uh, thieves followed by flea upper. So for the same setup, this is for uh, deficit irrigation. You can see gross margin $300 for control, all the way to $237 for thieves followed by flea upper. And full irrigation results, $390 gross margin for control treatment all the way to the worst treatment here is thrips followed by or sequentially by flea upper is $200, $207. So almost half year, 400 versus 200. So the full irrigation is more impacted because it's high input. So the loss is uh, proportionately also higher here. Okay, uh, summarizing, putting that all together, Trips reduce gross margin across all three water levels. This is the summary of this. So you can see these three lines, dry land blue, deficit irrigation orange, and full irrigation gray bar under on the control on the, uh, the left here. All those three are higher than the three circles. So that means, uh, uh, so trips reduced, gross margin regardless of the uh, irrigation. Second summary point, cotton flea upper reduced gross returns only under full irrigation. There are other, you know, little bit of reduction here, but uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, only under full, full irrigation, about $90 per acre was reduced. Uh, under full irrigation, it did not reduce uh, significantly under deficit or dry land. Third is sequential infestation of thrips and flea upper reduce gross returns by $128, so blue to blue, and $65, orange to orange, and $182 uh, uh, gray to gray, that is. Uh, full irrigation. So significant, I mean, much, well, all are significant. Uh, $65 is uh, uh, not to consider as not significant. Even statistically, that number is significant. But uh, uh, for farmers' perspective, a five year average, uh, it is a significant number. So dry land and full irrigation systems are therefore quite vulnerable for sequential infestations. So, and we are still working on the other two systems just like this for uh, ligers and stingbugs. But I'm gonna summarize some of the, uh, the achievements and uh, those, uh, uh, the points that I discussed so far. Number one, Thrips is a significant economic pest of cotton in the Texas high plains due to early season harsh weather conditions. 
and compensation can take place. But as I said earlier, uh, we don't have uh, luxury of having long growing season. We we may get sometimes uh, you know frost you know uh, even in early October or certainly by mid October. So it is uh, uh, we 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 cannot rely on the season. So we have to protect. Uh, uh, the cotton seedlings from thrips injury. Otherwise, the uh, growth will be stunted and it takes a long time for uh, that seedling to recover. But once it recovers, it goes pretty fast because what happens in our system is uh, when uh, apical growth is not possible because of uh, bad weather or the harsh, harsh weather conditions, the roots grow. Roots are very good. So root growth is much better than the, the shoot growth uh, until the weather becomes favorable. Uh, so uh, if we if we protect from thieves, that's much better, much, much healthier uh, system. Cotton can also compensate 15 to 20 percent filiopper induced fruit loss under full irrigation. Um, uh, as I said earlier, uh, more 15 percent than 20 percent. Uh, uh, but in dry lands, a low fruit uh, carrying capacity. So even if we, even if uh, flea upper uh, takes out 15 to 20 percent fruits from dry land, uh, it doesn't matter because if if plants do uh, bear those fruits, uh, it's going to shed because it cannot sustain. Uh, so um, it's uh, rarely justified for uh, flea upper control in dry land in our system. Ligus bugs are late season pests, could be ill reducers, uh, they could reduce, but unlikely to influence the fiber quality parameters. And uh, this research quantified the impact of single versus multiple pest infestations on cotton lentil and fiber quality under three irrigation water regimes, uh, and is still uh, planning to develop a dynamic optimization economic model that maximizes the net returns on various water by insect management scenarios. And the goal is to put those uh, uh, on the website so our farmers can go and uh, provide their like a yield goal and uh, maybe uh, at least get the heuristic value of that model to see uh, if they need to treat or not treat. Uh, we don't know yet whether that will be uh, applicable in our system because a uh, lot of our far farmers uh, like not to use insecticides at least early in the season to preserve natural enemies because of a low input system. We also discourage them to use certainly for thrips. We uh, encourage them to use seed treatment rather than foliar application. We want to preserve natural enemies. Uh, but a lot of our farmers, uh, you know, like to not use seed treatment uh, because uh, they want to uh, risk, uh, uh, you know, because seed treatments are expensive also. So there is a lot of things going on uh, in farmers' decision making. So once we put this on the website, at least they will have some, some heuristic value of, uh, of our models. And other products, our project had at least 15 undergraduate students, five graduate students, two postdocs, and three visiting scientists were trained within this project. Not paid or funded by this project, but uh, we had lots of leveraged funds to support this, uh, uh, this level of uh, uh, students and postdoc uh, training. 13 research articles, including two refereed and 11 proceeding papers were published in the last five years based on this project. And not necessarily all came out of this project, but they were all leverage funding and part of this uh, project. This grant helped leverage uh, uh, more than half a million uh, grants to expand the original research objectives. We are working on uh, cover crop affecting the in the irrigation and cover crop by irrigation uh, system and so forth. So we have lots of other uh, expanded version of this project, but this was the foundation uh, of those uh, research uh, projects. And more than 50 presentations were delivered based on this research at Turner meetings, Beltwide Cotton Conferences, ESA meetings, and international conferences. 
And uh, I was invited as keynote plenary speakers on this research, particularly on this particular research in China, India, and Brazil, I think India twice in the last five years. So uh, there was much more uh, value of this grant than just collecting data and uh, uh, generating useful information for our growers. It was more of a, uh, outreach, uh, not only within our region, within our country, but internationally, how uh, this uh, type of applied research uh, is uh, 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 helping uh, the overall integrated pest management program. And in every uh, Every presentation, uh, NIFA was recognized uh, as uh, uh, as the supporter of this project. Of course, there were other collaborations uh, also a part of this uh, uh, overall uh, research program that I am leading here. Uh, and this is my uh, uh, last slide. Just this slide uh, is here to illustrate the strong collaboration that uh, this fund and others. Uh, I have uh, created uh, in our IPM research program. Uh, we have partnership with uh, uh, with the NIFA project, partnership with Cotton Incorporated uh, projects, and Plains Cotton Growers, which is our uh, local local uh, uh, producer organization, and they are um, in uh, strong partnership with uh, uh, our uh, USDA NIFA research projects. They support our uh, research uh, proposal. They write the uh, uh, support uh, letter for our grants, and they support our research uh, all throughout. And every year, uh, these uh, 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 research reports are also presented to both Cotton Incorporated as well as to Plains Cotton Growers. And you can see in picture, uh, uh, we do uh, grower outreach, grower um uh, uh, education here i have my student and technician uh, talking to farmer here on the top left uh, um, uh, corner and a couple of students standing here they are the one doing uh, the research here uh, some of the you know all the different uh, you know as i said earlier we had some uh, uh the Ligus release and so forth. We did uh, nipple release. You can see on the right side of that. We also did the cage study. We wanted to make sure that uh, we understand the difference between nipple damage and the adult damage. So I, you know, I have not included those here because of the time. But we had generated so much data. You can see our uh, uh, undergraduate students there collecting data. Uh, a lot of training there. So that's. Uh, that's the kind of quick uh, summary of my presentation. So, well, thank you so much. It looks like uh, we already have questions for you. Yes, please. <laughs> so, so uh, go, go ahead. Do I go and uh, check in here or how do I do? Let's see, I, I can read them out for you because um, the way that Zoom set up, not everybody can see them. So I'll read it for you. It says, um, I may have missed this in your presentation, but what are your next research objectives or projects in the cotton system? And do any of these involve reducing reliance upon chemical pesticides? Uh, could you reiterate one more time? I think that's a very interesting question. Yes. Say, yeah. uh -huh. uh, what, what are your next research objectives or projects in the cotton system, and do any of these involve reducing reliance upon chemical pesticides? Yes, absolutely. As I alluded to you earlier, right before the ending of my presentation, uh, I have begun the um, uh, 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 cover crop in relation to water management, uh, three water level with cover crops, two cover crops, rye and uh, wheat, uh, and no cover. I'm uh, thinking of expanding to legumes and so forth, and uh, trying to see if I can do the natural enemy conservation, i.e. predators in our region. We don't have very many parasitoids working because of semi-arid region. 
Uh, they don't do too well here, but we do have a strong predator complex. Um, and uh, uh, the focus here is uh, uh, how we can uh, reduce pesticide in cotton. And I can also tell you that Texas High Plains is uh, proud to say that we are the lowest insecticide use region in the cotton belt. Uh, and also I had alluded to you before that our farmers uh, are educated enough and they attend all our seminars and uh, you know all our uh, extension and we have extension folks. They do more work than I do on the outreach. Uh, and, and farmers are um, very aware that if they use insecticides or definitely harsh insecticide early on, then uh, predators cannot recolonize in our system. We are pretty much monoculture cotton. We have wall-to-wall -wall cotton, so we don't have very many ways for predators to come back. So we preserve. So, you know, uh, our growers are very, very mindful of not uh, applying insecticides or uh, during the early growing season or even mid growing season or use softer insecticides when possible. And I think our research is gearing toward that. I hope I address at least part of the uh, query. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it, I'm, I'm glad that extension is is working with you to uh make sure that farmers know um about all those things that are so important uh another question that we have coming in is um did the research looked at or sorry did the research look at the influence of deficit irrigation on aphids and beneficial insect complex wonderful question uh, uh yes we didn't have uh, uh, a great information on that, uh, the beneficial, but if it's certainly. Uh, I have those data, you know, hopefully someday I'll present, but beneficial, I didn't have very good uh, luck on getting the beneficial uh, uh, data information. We had very low uh, beneficial insect densities in my trial because of uh, we have. Uh, Alfalfa uh, kind of close by, and uh, that is always lush, and they attract all insects. The predators stay there. Uh, there is not much insect in cotton, so they don't come. So um, I have to now. I think my focus this time is with the cover crops. I hope to enhance the both pest and predator complex in my own field uh, with respect to water level. So hopefully I will have those data generated. But in terms of cotton aphids, yes, there will be a lot more cotton aphids in um, uh, high irrigation followed by low irrigation and dry land. There is a clear staircase effect of aphid abundance uh, with respect to water. Oh, great, okay. Um... And they, they have a follow-up question to that. Um, thank you for that answer. Did deficit irrigation prompt any spider mite issues either in Texas or Georgia? Uh, I don't, I think Mike, uh, Dr. Tays, uh, I think he talked about some spider mite. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, I don't want to miss his pick here, but in Texas or in Texas High Plains, we don't have spider mite issues unless cotton is, I mean, the corn is planted just adjacent to cotton. Then only we get some, but uh, we just don't, because we don't have much corn in, uh, because of the low water, we don't have corn. It's, uh, uh, you know, north of Plainview, Texas, or north of I-40. Uh, so um, uh, perhaps because it's a wall-to-wall -wall cotton and cotton, for whatever reason, doesn't uh, our cotton doesn't get uh, much uh, spider mite issue. And late in the season on dry land acres, if it's really dry, we do get some, but 
I can't remember uh, we have uh, ever applied insecticide for uh, spider mite management in uh, cotton in our region. But we do see late in the season when, uh, when that that time it's kind of late anyway. Uh, we just we just ignore them. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. And um, I have a follow up question too. Thinking about um, how many presentations you've done on this. Um, so when you're speaking internationally to folks. What are their questions like? Are they are they also experiencing water deficit? Are they um, wh what kind of answers are they looking for? I'm just curious. I think they are looking at uh, first of all, though. I mean, they want to hear what type of IPM research is done in US. I think that's <laughs> uh, right. Th that's the thing, and. Uh, 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 you know, usually the, these are done in like a, um, uh, uh, climate resilience, uh, agriculture type conference and uh, uh, insecticide low, you know, organic or um, uh, reduced insecticide type. Uh, so they, they are looking for um, where integrated pest management can be used with, um, I, I think they were looking for more of a cropping system when we are talking about, um, you know, water, uh, you know, compensation of crops. So uh, when I tell them, okay, 15 to 20 percent uh, square loss, you don't need to worry about it. And when I show them data, yes, if you lose 15% of fruit loss in the first week of uh, squaring, plant can compensate. I think that tells them, especially in India, um, you know, they are also low input. So I think their their cropping system and our system, high plant system actually matches because they are also low input and we are also low input. So I think they are looking at more of a cropping system and how insect research can be done in uh, system approach. That's so interesting and very valuable to them, I'm sure. Um, we, we have an, another question here. Uh, they said they may have missed this early on, but were any BT cotton varieties included? Uh, yes, we purposefully planted BT so that we don't have uh caterpillar coming in and messing up with the effect of our thrips flea upper so we that was our strategic goal so that we don't want the confounding effect because we are only looking at um the effect of uh, thrips flea uppers or ligus all the plant bugs thrips and plant bugs whether it's a flea uppers ligus bugs or sting bugs all being plant bugs we wanted to have caterpillar uh, totally out of the picture, so uh, we we can have cleaner uh, information. Yes, it was all BT in both Georgia and Texas all years. Gotcha. Well, that's all the questions that I'm seeing. Um, I did want to ask you, as you were doing this research, and now you have the findings, and you've done all kinds of talks on it. Is there anything that you're really excited about after doing this research or any findings that stick out to you um, as you're thinking about doing things in the future? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. I think uh, any research, when we get, whether you get a positive or negative data, you get excited because uh, uh, you find something interesting, and if you find negative data and you 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 have uh, you are curious why so, uh, <clears throat> but in this case, I was expecting. Frankly, I was not expecting that. Uh, uh, you know irrigation or the full irrigation is uh, uh, more susceptible or we lose more when we are doing it. and again we are not done with the uh, uh, final economic analysis all the fiber parameters and so forth but i thought uh, high input high yield uh, that could uh, you know that that would have more masking effect that will compensate more and uh, uh, will we, we'll not have 
more loss, but economic economic analysis shows that high input system is more vulnerable than dry land or low input system. So um, that's why I'm using this uh, cover crop study, looking at again the water system and then see whether the cover crop, uh, my expectation is cover crop will modulate the soil health. And especially if I have, I have not done that yet, but my plans are to use, compare uh, graminaceous or uh, the, the, uh, the wheat and rye versus uh, uh, cowpea and veg and so forth, and then see whether uh, nitrogen fixation and uh, water conservation and soil health improvement and so forth, will that affect? Uh, so uh, the overall, uh, the overall profit for farmers. So I'm excited to kind of uh, dig a little deeper on this. So great question. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. It's always good when when our research keeps fueling us. Yeah. And, I'll, and I'll mention, sorry to interrupt you, but I'll mention one thing that probably deserves to be mentioned here. I'm a 100% cotton entomologist, designated cotton guy for the state of Texas. But uh, this research uh, got some interest uh, 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 in uh, maize or corn breeder here uh, at the Lubbock site. So he asked me whether I would be willing to compare some of his elite lines and do this same set of our similar set of our trials with uh, uh, three water levels and so forth. Of course, the uh, corn's water levels are way different than cotton's water level. 100% uh, water for cotton, 100% uh, uh, water for corn is at least 120% of cotton's 100%. So right. to adjust that, but um, so he asked me to do that. So we got the NIFA funded for that project, but without, uh, so I got so interested. So now I'm looking at the same trial at that higher than, so 120% water level, what happens? What does cotton do? So that kind of thing. So there are so much other thing I'm doing that that's not even part of this, nor funded by NIFA. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, and stuff that you couldn't even have imagined when you started this project. So that is amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your presentation today. We really appreciate it. I think this research is really exciting um, and obviously leading to all kinds of people learning new things and um, new partnerships in the future. So best of luck to you in, in your future research. Um, and thanks again for this presentation. And thanks a bunch, and I'll be happy to share the presentation if you uh, uh, if you would like to also. Okay. Well, I am going to um, open the mic now to our co-director of the Southern IPM Center. He's going to talk just briefly. We thought that people on this call might be interested in something that we've got going on um, in the cotton world. So, Roger, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about the upcoming Pest Management Strategic Plan Workshop. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Paragioli. There was a recent study done by our evaluator, um, Tegan, uh, uh, Tegan, in our office, who found that uh, the lack of IPM uh, economic benefit data was a major obstacle to IPM adoption. So thank you for publishing this work, and I think it's going to be influential. Uh, we just wanted to make sure that you're aware um, we're working with Kater Haik, who I'm sure you know. He's going to be leading a pest management strategic plan for the high plains and the rolling plains. Um, so we'd like to, uh, you know, communicate with you about that effort. We're hoping to hold the workshop um, in uh, March of next year, two workshops. And absolutely, to, absolutely. Uh, and I will be delighted to be part of that. Thank you, Roger. Uh, thank you very much. And to anybody else on the call who's interested, if they could just maybe drop Ka uh, Kayla a line and uh, we can also loop you in. So thank you very much again for your webinar. Thanks so much. Glad to do it. And again, one more time, I I appreciate it uh, the and on behalf of the entire uh, my colleagues and Texas A and M uh, the support of NIFA that means a lot and our producers do appreciate uh, NIFA supporting this research. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Well. Um, as of right now, we are coming up with our next lineup of Southern IPM Hour 
webinars. Uh, we don't have anything just yet, but there will be things posted soon. Um, probably the next one will be in August, just because it looks like July is a pretty crazy month for everyone. Um, so if you want to find out more about that, you can uh, see the full lineup of upcoming webinars at southernipm.org. And we look forward to seeing you soon. So thank you so much. <laughs>